if you don't know, right now, Disney seems to be cooking the books when it comes to Star Wars. There's a brand new SEC filing out, and one of the slides in this SEC filing is claiming that Star Wars, the franchise, has made $12 billion off of a $4 billion initial investment, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Earned back almost three times what they bought the franchise for. You're going to have to tell us. Is that true? Is this, are they cooking the books? <sighs> well, okay. Let me, and I realize that's an, an, a simple expression to cook the books. I just want to be clear. Regulators watching out there. <laughs> we're not going to allege any crimes going I added on here. I have a question mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I added no. a question mark. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, I put a question mark to make sure that they know that it's, I, I'm not saying they No, did. no, no, I know. I know. I'm asking a question. Are they cooking the books? No, I mean, in, in the sense that are they committing a crime or doing something nefarious here? No, not really. Yeah. What, they, what they have done here is there have been a multitude of SEC filings uh, by Disney, by Tryon. <laughs> Blackwell's Capital, which is another uh, proxy fighter against Disney. And Tryon is, that's Nelson Peltz. Tryon is Nelson trying Peltz. Trying to get a, a foothold into the boardroom at Disney. Into the boardroom, along with former Disney chief financial officer Jay Rasula. Uh, and then they've got a lot of shares from Ike Perlmutter, who was the one that sold Marvel yep. to Disney back about 15, 16 years ago. He was responsible for the television uh, arm of Marvel back in the day. Yeah, television, and they also they got the they got Iron Man and Cap yep. going all that before Disney came in and bought it. Uh, so they they set up that architecture. A lot of that was done by John Favreau and then um, Kevin Feige to a lesser extent at that point. But so what Disney is doing here is they're trying to say that hey everything's fine and dandy, everything is a lot better than than what people are making it out to be. So they have come up with this investor presentation, which you, I guess you probably have up on screen now. Um, and they, they talk about a few of the franchises, Frozen, Toy Story, Avengers, and Star Wars. Then down at the bottom, uh, in very, very fine print, this is how they're coming up with this. So if you look, they, they say that, uh, what was it, uh, Toy Story here, 5.5 times return on investment. Marvel, or the Avengers, 3.3 uh, times return on investment and Star Wars at 2.9. Let's show that here for so they can get a quick image of what we're looking at here. They also include like the various milestones and steps as to what was on during the production of these projects. Right. And so what's key to understand is the way they're presenting this to the average Joe investor out there. Uh, they say if you look at the bottom it reflects the ratio between revenue and investment on titles released following Disney's acquisition of the IP. Revenue reflects aggregate 10-year revenue streams, both generated, and here's a key word, and expected. Yeah. So we've got some phantom, we think this might, could possibly, could happen yeah. in the next few years. In the fine print where you can barely read it. Right. Yeah. Now, what this includes is directly associated theatrical releases, including theatrical home entertainment, TV, both pay and free. This would include streaming, folks, as well as PVOD. You bought the movie on iTunes or Amazon or something like that. And consumer products. Does not include things like derivative revenue streams such as park attractions, nor does it include DTC originals associated with those franchises or pre-established franchise consumer products revenue. Which is interesting because they included that in the graphic. Yeah. So here, here's the first part. Let's look at, you know, take Toy Story, for example. They didn't say Pixar. They said Toy Story, specifically Toy Story. Frozen wasn't an acquired IP. That was created at Disney. Now let's go down here. Now at first you look at this and you go, you see the Avengers and you think Marvel. But it's not Marvel. It's just the Avengers. Yeah. They're not including the $4 billion they paid to Ike Perlmutter, about $3 billion of which he still has in Disney stock, which is what Nelson Peltz is voting, folks. Okay, That's where he's gotten a lot of those shares from. It's strictly, if you read the fine print down here, what they're getting this 3.3x uh, return on capital is the following. Avengers, Age of Ultron, Infinity War, Endgame. Four movies. Forget the three to four billion dollars they've dropped that they've spent with literally no return because it's on Disney Plus mm -hmm. on all of the Disney Plus Marvel series. That's not included in there. Guess what? Same thing with Star Wars. All they've included with Star Wars, if you look at it, is according to this in the Disney's own words. I got to scroll over to it. Sorry. We've got uh, The Force Awakens, Rogue One, 
Last Jedi, Solo, Rise of Skywalker. Here's what's not included in there after they spent the $4 billion, which is not included in this figure, to buy not Star Wars, but Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm included Star Wars and included Indiana Jones and included Willow, all the properties under Lucasfilm. Also, a very functional and profitable Skywalker sound and ILM, yeah. Industrial Lights and Magic. Post-production. Yep. How much of the $4 billion did Disney spend on Lucasfilm that they're attributing to Star Wars? Let's say that they're... Now, realistically, the bulk of that $4 billion should have been for Star Wars when they bought Lucasfilm. But let's say Disney is only assigning $2 billion. Yeah of that purchase price. So you can really jack the return on capital up depending on what you're considering your capital to be. Yeah. It isn't four billion, it can't be, because other things, like I said, Skywalker Sound and, and ILM and, and all these other properties, these valuable properties were in there, granted even though Star Wars was the most. And they're not including the money they've spent to then continue to make, for, like like making- uh, Nothing on Disney Plus is included. Nothing on Disney Plus, but also none of the theme park rides. Theme parks. Make any money Two and a half billion yeah. dollars of CapEx on two Galaxy's Edge theme parks and the Star Wars Hotel, which was about a half a billion, yeah. so two and a half billion total, which they have closed. Yeah after a year of operation and then had to write the remaining whatever they hadn't uh, depreciated yet on the building, the other $350 billion, I think is what they wrote off last year during one of the earnings calls. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to write off $350 billion? Right? Yeah. So all of this, basically what they did was they said, "Here's this is what we made on the box office for Star Wars yep. against, and then that included, that included some consumer products, which again, they said not classic Star Wars, just the new stuff, but here's the other problem with it too. They said it didn't include DTC originals, right? It didn't include The Mandalorian and all that stuff that they spent between those three seasons, between Andor. Uh, Andor was like $250 million. Yeah. Dollars we're, we're talking over a, another billion yeah. dollars of CapEx to make those Disney Plus shows, yeah. minimum. But what is included on there, and this is where the whole issue of the 10-year expected return comes in, and this is where the bullshit really is, okay? The bullshit is in the fact that where do these movies now go? Both Marvel on here and Star Wars once they leave the theaters. They go to Disney Plus. Yeah. Well, that's literally moving a twenty dollar bill from the right pocket to the left pocket in your pants and say, look, we made twenty bucks over here. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't work. Now you can do that. It's fine in accounting because there is a multitude of corporate entities under the Disney banner. Hundreds and hundreds of separate LLCs and different corporations. On top of the other studios like Searchlight, right. 20th Century Fox, yeah. So the way they do this, folks out there watching, is that Disney, for example, used to have a contract with Netflix. And if you remember, all the way up until 2019, when Disney Plus started in late 2019, you could go find all of the Marvel movies, even the Star Wars movies. They were on Netflix. Netflix, it was a multi-year, multi-billion dollar deal with Netflix for that. That was a general, I mean, that was a genuine cash flow. Yeah. Netflix cut a check for that billion dollars over time, a couple of years, but they cut a check for that. That was revenue into Disney. Yeah. What Disney does now is that when a movie leaves the theater, in order to say, oh no, the movie was successful. Y'all remember when The Rock last year tried to tell everybody that Black Adam was successful yep. and they showed the numbers? Well, that part of that was Warner Brothers paying itself for that pay one window for it to go on max. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's phantom money. Yep. Disney's doing the same thing. So they can say, okay, look, we have The Force Awakens. The Force Awakens was a $2 billion picture. Avatar was a $2 billion picture, right? But they, Disney doesn't own that one, James Cameron does. And they say, well, what if we had actually licensed this out to Netflix or to Amazon Prime? What would we be paid for this 18-month pay one window, pay two window, whatever, they, or in perpetuity, as in the case of Disney Plus? Well, the $2 billion box office movie might be worth $200, $300, $400 $400 million. Disney just paid $75 million to get a short stint for Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. <laughs> now, start, like, yes! now start doing the math on some of these big pictures. Yeah. I mean, you look at Universal. So what they're doing is they're saying, these movies made this return. A big portion of this return is on revenues that Disney paid to itself yeah. from the Disney Plus credit card, which is why, folks, Disney Plus is about $15 billion in the hull, DTC in general. Yeah, and yeah. they keep talking about how the, they're lowering. It's getting closer to profitability every quarter. That's what they focus on. They focus on closer to well, profitability. Well, but profitability in a quarter, yeah. not erasing the $15 yeah. billion in the hole. That's already been invested. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, also, there's a lot of talk on, uh, like, right under that. They're talking about global accountability, and they're touting the idea of cost-effective of, uh, cost production, which is... <laughs> 
hilarious coming from any of these companies right now. Mm -hmm. uh, reducing the content output, which they're trying to frame as a good thing mm -hmm. rather than what it is, which is that our products aren't making the money they're supposed to be making. We're not having the subscriber growth that we were hoping to have at this point. Therefore, we have to pare back what we're spending right. because we have to save money somewhere. Yeah, yep. It says we've reduced content output with fewer projects and improved quality. We're targeting a $4.5 billion reduction of annualized entertainment cash content spend. Mm -hmm. yep. So Bob Iger, he's saying we're going to spend less and make less at the same time. Right. And, and now they're kind of what I felt like when I was reading through the SEC filing was that they're trying to make it seem better than it is because of what's going on with the with Nelson Peltz. Right? That, that's basically what this is. Yeah, it's, it's a big smoke screen. And we've talked about this before. I mean, we actually cover the Disney earnings calls. We'll be covering the Disney annual shareholder meeting. That's the spiciest one of the year. The Disney annual shareholder meeting, I believe, is April 3rd. We'll be live for that as well. And we usually get a pretty big crowd for those things. Um, but that being said, what they're trying to do right now is look at how good, and Bob Iger talked about this at the Morgan Stanley conference uh, a couple of weeks ago when he did that, two days before Nelson Peltz's town hall that he did with Tryon. He said, operating income is better here. OI is better here. Operating income, EBITDA. So these are all profitability metrics, yeah. right? But what, if you dig into it and you realize that the vast majority of this boost in OI, operating income or EBITDA, earnings before interest, yeah. taxes, depreciation, amortization, it's a, it's a profit metric. And it's a key profit metric on Wall Street for sure. But what it means is in, in Disney's case, they've gotten to where they are because of the cuts like you were just talking about. They haven't grown that much significantly. Yeah. It's mostly the cuts. The problem is, is that you can only cut your way to profitability for so long. You is can't this... cut your way to growth. So they have to be producing content that's engaging people. That's why they're hanging all of their hopes. I'm going to tell you right now, I'll be willing to bet, I'll say it right here, Deadpool 3 mm -hmm. is going to have one of the most robust, biggest spends on, on marketing that Disney has probably done in a few years. Because Bob Iger made it plain, he was really looking forward to that one this year. Like he, he he's he, the in his in his world, the future fate of the MCU will hang in the balance on how well the performance of Deadpool is. Yeah. I don't think that's the case. I think Deadpool is going to be an outlier. I think it's going to do well. That's what I. Uh, that's well, what it's I said. weird I because Deadpool isn't even considered by consumers in the same way as. MCU films. No, but it's they're going to try to use the movie to parlay and leverage it into that. Did you see that uh, yeah. Henry Cavill is supposed to make a cameo as a version of Wolverine in that? That ca They're talking about yeah. him being Wolverine, yeah. What, yeah. what version of Wolverine? Uh, like Berserker. So, like, he's going to be, like, a, there's going to be variants of Wolverine and variants of... Because we got a multiverse, man. Yeah, they can come from anywhere now. Also, another thing you want. That, <laughs> another thing that they were pushing here that they, it seems to be what they're doing to try and bolster confidence is they've re-announced Patty Jenkins doing Rogue Squadron, of course, because she's not doing Wonder uh, did Woman. Did they re-announce that, or did Patty come out and say that? Patty came it's, out and said yeah. that. Yeah. That's right, Ryan exactly. Johnson still working <laughs> yeah. on his trilogy. Patty, uh, yeah. Patty she says... They, I, I owe them a script. I was like, I thought that movie was canceled, right? Like, uh, <laughs> She said, when I left Star Wars to do Wonder Woman 3 and I started working on that, we talked about, well, maybe I'll come back to Star Wars after Wonder Woman 3. So we started a deal for that to happen. Uh, when Wonder Woman 3 then went away, <laughs> Lucasfilm and I were There's like, a reason. oh, we've got to finish this deal. We finished the deal right as the strike was beginning. So now I owe a draft of Star Wars. So we'll see what happens there. Who knows? She just like maybe if I we'll just see what speak happens this into existence. The when, when Wonder Woman three went away, went like, away. What does when, that mean? when she got fired from it, uh, <laughs> when, gave you yeah. full control over Wonder Woman two. Do you and think we forgot? <laughs> it got kind of rapey, and then they're like, I don't think we're gonna do a Wonder Woman three. Well, she was really upset over the first movie because she thought that she should have the coveted writer director credits. So she got director credits, but she didn't get writer credits. Yeah. So she wanted that for the second one and. Studio wasn't going to argue because the first one did well enough to where they thought, okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. And then we all saw what happened with the second one. Patty Jenkins is a very competent director, especially with Wonder Woman. But when it comes to actually screenwriting, that's a different no. skill set. Yes, and your writing is. is the reason why the second one is hated. That was poo. Yeah. <laughs> so then she continued, they have a hard job in front of them of what's the first movie they're going to do about Lucasfilm. They mm -hmm. have other directors who have been working, but I'm back on doing Rogue, Rogue Squadron. We'll see what happens. We need to get it where we're both super happy with it. Mm -hmm. But that's still not confirmed to be officially happening. Sitting on the shelf with Ryan Johnson's trilogy outline. I'm just telling you right now.
<laughs> she says she would be absolutely happy to make Rogue Squadron, adding the emotion of Star Wars and what it stands for is something so beautiful in this world. If I can do something beautiful and do something that serves that audience, I would love to do it. I love the when they speak in these like verbose ways when they're trying to pitch themselves to people or pitch their products to people. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye guys.